apologies for interrupting your conversations, but if I could just have your attention. My, my name is Brian Burgess, I'm Chairman of Supporters Direct. I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening to, for this uh, Cooperatives United event to celebrate the role of cooperative movement in sport, and, and particularly tonight, of course, with a focus on football, because we're in this, this magnificent National Football Museum, which is a, a wonderful venue and a wonderful asset for football and for Manchester. So I hope you're going to take a look round later on and find some inspiration upstairs in the museum. And I'd like to thank the museum for allowing us to this opportunity to host this event tonight. And of course, events like this always take a lot of organisation. And I'd like to thank Roy from the Cooperative Group, Vicky Goodfellow from Support the Group, and Phil Frampton from C United for their uh, efforts to organise what I hope will be a very enjoyable event for everyone. I'd like to thank the Cooperative Group for their sponsorship of the event and for the support that they give to support is great, which we very much value. Uh, by the way, I'd like uh, to, you to support the organisers by buying the raffle tickets. I don't think I've seen any of them. There will be a raffle tickets on the sale. And then you go to the Homeless World Cup, which is a very, very good cause, so I hope you'll show your appreciation for receiving by the <laughs> Supporters Direct is very proud to be part of the cooperative movement. And we're very pleased to be playing a small part in the UN International Year of Cooperatives and in the week of celebrations here in Manchester under the banner of Cooperatives United. I am very pleased to be able to introduce in a moment Russell Gill, the head of membership of the Cooperative Group, who will explain more about Cooperative United. Russell and his colleagues at support at uh, the Cooperative Group have been very good friends of Supporters Direct, and you'll hear more about that and about Supporters Direct following Russell uh, from our Supporters Direct Chief Executive, David Lambert. I was very excited in the summer that we were able to attract David to join us and lead us because his background and experience as a chartered accountant and seven years at the Football Association working in governance and regulation before he took the very brave step uh, taking on the job of Chief Executive of Portman Football Club at what must be his most turbulent time in his history. I think that all stands in a very good step to lead the Supporters Trust movement forward in the future. And following David, you'll hear from another inspiring leader, Andy Walsh of FC United, the role model here in Manchester, showing the rest of the world another model, another way of running football clubs. I was lucky enough to come to an opening event here back in the summer. And after walking around the exhibits upstairs, the one image that stuck in my mind was a strangely small photo up there of Jimmy Hill. <coughs> Jimmy Hill at that time was chairman of the Professional Footballers Association, and he negotiated the end of the maximum wage for footballers. And yes, I did say maximum wage, not minimum. I can remember when I was a small boy, a very small boy, dreaming of becoming a footballer. My father saying to me, no son, you stick to your schoolwork, because being a footballer isn't a viable career. They, they can only get paid a maximum of 20 pounds a week. It seems incredible, if you don't believe me, it's up there on the photo. But it seems incredible that during my lifetime, footballers, whether they were the captain of England or the highest paid players in Manchester could earn no more than £20 a week. Players in the game were an important group, but they were rather taken for granted, sometimes exploited and certainly undervalued. And Jimmy Hill and his colleagues changed all that. They negotiated a major change in the game, which has led indirectly to the 
privileged lifestyles that footballers can enjoy today. But in the years that have followed, there's been another group of very key stakeholders in the game that I think have been taken for granted, sometimes exploited, and rather undervalued. And I'm talking, of course, about supporters. But that has all started to change. It started to change thanks to people like Andy, like David, and many others. There is upstairs in the museum a fan zone which celebrates the role of fans and it concentrates on the passion and the loyalty of supporters. Because I remember it, it takes a rather romantic view of fans as spectators. And I look forward to coming back here in future years to seeing the new exhibits as time moves on and the exhibits are updated and seeing that future generations will be able to learn about what will have been the historic role of supporters in general and supporters' trust in particular in changing the governance of the game for good. Because I believe it will change, it is changing, and it's being changed by the application of cooperative values. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Russell Gill, Head of Membership at the Cooperative Guild. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to add uh, my welcome uh, to you all. Uh, what a fantastic venue to be holding this reception. Um, within a couple of weeks of this, uh, this museum opening, I was here twice. Uh, Firstly, to bring my son to uh, open his eyes to 1970s football cards and Sabutio. And then, secondly, a week later with a stag party to remember all the football matches that we can only half remember. And I think that possibly says an awful lot about many of us and our relationship as fans of football. Now, here at, uh, in Manchester, as part of Cooperative United, we really do have the world cooperative movement. movement on our doorstep in all its glory and all its magnificence. From retail consumer cooperatives to the smallest producing cooperative, from fair trade to housing, from sport to agriculture, you will see all flavour and all manner of cooperative represented over at Manchester Central. And I do hope while you are in Manchester, you take the opportunity to visit Manchester Central and take time to discuss with cooperators from around the world and also from around the UK what it is that makes their cooperative special. Because as you seek to make your supporters trust and indeed the other cooperative organisations that you're part of special to you, bear in mind we can all learn from one another and all take stimulus from the successes and achievements of the cooperative movement in its broadest possible sense. Today is a report has been launched which says that the three hundred largest cooperatives in the world account for a turnover of two trillion pounds. Two trillion pounds is larger than any multinational corporation can ever claim. Two trillion pounds is actually larger than the Canadian economy. If there was such a thing as the G9 rather than the G8, it would be the cooperative movement who would be sitting alongside everybody else. Which I think is a fantastic indication of how cooperative enterprise in all its guises is not only a fabulous social movement, but it is also a movement that is making a real impact and a real change in the economic well-being and the economic success of our society in this country, but also global society. That's what Cooperatives United is all about. It's about celebrating the achievement of cooperative enterprise as part of this International Year of Cooperatives. And we're indeed very grateful to the United Nations for giving us the opportunity to celebrate all that is great about cooperatives. Now, I'm here speaking at least in part because we are, at the Cooperative Group, very proud of our association with Supporters Direct. In some respects, we were there at the outset when there was lots of enthusiasm, lots of passion, lots of ideas as to how we might develop a greater support of participation in football clubs. And that's seen many, many supporters' trust become established and been proud to be associated with that over the years. We've also been proud to be there in solidarity when Supporters Direct perhaps went through some tougher times as well, as all good cooperators should be. <coughs> and I'm very keen to say that the Cooperative Group at least there stood side by side with Supporters Direct and indeed with individual Supporters Trust as you continue to grow and develop and become ever more successful. 
So all that really less with me to do this for the rest of this evening is to wish you a very good reception this evening. Hope that you will have the time to join us at Cultures United in Manchester and hope you have a really good time tonight. Thank you very much and I'll now hand over to David. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Russell, and thanks, Brian, also for your kind words uh, of introduction and uh, finding a very positive way to describe my term of office at Portsmouth Football Club, uh, which is you know, sometimes tricky, but something that, by the way, we as Portsmouth Direct are fighting very hard to make uh, a beacon of hope for the cooperative movement uh, as we speak, uh, and, an, and a very important beacon of hope in the football <coughs> landscape. Uh, to convert that to support a uh, led corporate ownership as well. I can't think of a better place uh, to hold tonight's event, uh, a venue uh, not only steeped in uh, the richness of football history, but also obviously in the heartland of, uh, of the cooperative movement. The cooperative movement in football actually isn't that new. I mean, we will talk obviously, and I will say a few words about what Supporters Direct has done since it, uh, uh, since it uh, came to fruition in about 12 years ago. But actually, cooperatives are what football is all about. Football clubs, at their very heart, are groups of people wanting to participate, wanting to organise themselves uh, collectively. And that really is at the very foundation of what football and football clubs uh, mean, uh, both to people and to communities. In that respect, there have been a number of very notable successes. You'll hear in a moment from uh, Andy uh, at uh, FC United of Manchester. Uh, a success story that we're very proud of. But more widely, obviously, there are significant successes in other, in other countries and in other sports. But actually, the cooperative movement still has a, a very significant uh, fight in football uh, to become more widely accepted and a fight against the, the more uh, commercial march uh, that, is, that is obviously more prevalent, certainly in English football, over the last 20 years. So SD, I believe, has a very important role in that, and I'm very proud to, to lead the organisation to promote those values that Brian talked about, those cooperative values, and hopefully to enable a better way forward for football, based on and centred on the cooperative actions of its supporters, the supporters who are the lifeblood, the economic lifeblood, the social and cultural lifeblood of the sport. And by doing that, I think we can all create a future for the sport that is more sustainable, more equitable, and more democratic. In that respect, I think SD has made huge strides. I think we now have uh, nearly or over 175 uh, supporters trusts within our membership, uh, and we have 32 uh, cooperatively owned clubs within the UK. That's something that we should all be, uh, we should all celebrate. And tonight is part of that. And last year, in the last year, it's probably been arguably one of our most successful. We've converted 10 new clubs uh, to mutual ownership. We've uh, expanded our reach into Europe, where we now uh, have a presence in 20 or so countries, uh, and we've received new uh, funding streams from the European Commission. For the first time ever, our, the membership of our family, our cooperative football family within SD, has tipped through 300,000 members uh, in, uh, in the UK, which is an incredible statistic, I think. And also we've played a very uh, important and central part to the government's uh, review of football governance uh, in this country. And again, I think that uh, is ample recognition of the increasingly important role uh, that supporters can play in making not only football, but wider society uh, espouse greater values of cooperation. Now, none of this would have been at all possible without the support of the cooperative group, and I, I want to extend my personal thanks to, to Russell and to the group for the support they've shown us. A year or so ago, SD was in uh, a quite a tricky position in terms of its funding, and as Russell has alluded to, it's when you are in those positions that you find out who your friends really are, and I think it's a, a massive testament to the support that the cooperative group has given this organisation that they were able to step in and to continue to support what we've done as an organisation. So my heartfelt thanks uh, to Russell and to the cooperative group and to everyone who has played a part in supporting us over the, over the last year. 
Hey, well, let, uh, the only other thing I need to do is to introduce Andy Walsh, who's somebody who probably doesn't need any introduction in these parts. Uh, a long-time uh, campaigner, supporter of Manchester United, and now obviously an inspirational uh, leader, general manager of FC United of Manchester, which is a success story not only in terms of what it means to the cooperative group, but also for me in how a football club can be run based on positive community values and be successful in doing just that. So I'm delighted to hand over to Andy to say a few words. Billing now, and that's always. Uh, firstly, uh, a Manchester welcome to Manchester, not just from me, but also from the pissing rain outside. We <laughs> played that on Specially Fire just to let you know that New Yorkers aren't the only ones who can have a swim uh, and, and on the streets. So, uh, I, I really want to want to say uh, a big thank you to, to, to Sports Direct for giving us the opportunity to, to talk about FC United tonight. Uh, all of you who follow a football club will no need any invitation to talk about your football club and I've got a microphone and people stood in front of me who can't go anywhere so uh, thank you very much uh, for that. I think I just want to rest first on some of the, the, the things that, that, that David and Brian have said there and just allow you to drink that in. That 12 years ago Supporters Direct was established with a target of setting up 30 supporters trusts, just 30. We've now got more than 30 football clubs owned by supporters in 12 years. That is incredible. There are 173 trusts now. And then there are over 300,000 people, David just said, who are members of those trusts. That is just, that is unbelievable statistic. People who tell us that fans can't run football clubs will look around football. There's plenty of business people who haven't got a clue about the football clubs who are causing problems that we're having to pick up, pick up the pieces from. We're now, as supporters direct, as supporters groups, because it's not just about it's not just about fans trust, it's not just about supporter owned clubs, it's about fan groups as well, and it's great that the, 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 the links that have been that we fought to maintain with, with other supporters groups are still there. Malcolm Clark's here tonight from the Football Supporters Federation all the independent supporters groups around the country who are working together and that's not easy because let's face it football is as much about dividing us as it is about putting things between us as well the rivalries within the game are just as important as they are as, as they are standing here talking about what unites us as football players the fact that we can hold that together is a real threat to the establishment and that's one of the reasons why the premier league took a pop at supporting the direct a short time ago. It's because we reckon, we, we, we're, we're bringing them on some reckoning. That one of the biggest crashes in the game was Portsmouth, a Premier League club. And who's going to rescue it? The fans are going to rescue it. David being the glory boy just nipped in and got the, got the top job at Supporters Direct just in time. So just to finish the virtuous circle, he was there just as he was on the, just as Portsmouth was on the slide, he's going to be there just as Portsmouth pop, pop back up and then they're going to be the, the, uh, the supporter owned model uh, further up the pyramid than any other supporter owned club. <clears throat> but we have got supporter owned clubs in the Football League. There's Exeter and Wimbledon. But also Wickham have just gone back into supporter ownership because not being supporter ownership didn't fit. To be perfectly frank, not being supporter ownership shouldn't fit with any football club. It should be the supporters. The first thing the director says when they go on the board is I've been a supporter of this football club all my life. I'm not standing for a lecture. I'm just going to be here. Because I have the right to be here because I've got a bit of cash or I've got a mate on the board who's invited me. What are you frightened of? If you want to represent this football club and you want to be custodian of the football club that me, my family and generations of my family have supported all our lives, what have you got to hide? Stand for election. But they won't. They try and tell us there's other reasons why they won't do it. And the real reason is, is they've not really got the interests of the football club at heart for many of them. Many of them are there just for their own personal ego, certainly at the top of the game, or their own personal enrichment. 
There are many, many, many hundreds of directors further down the pyramid who are struggling to keep their football club alive. And I would say to them, what have you got to lose? Turn to no supporters. There's a story from the 1960s when um, <coughs> Louis Edwards told Matt Busby that he was going to have a, a share issue at Old Trafford. And Busby says, well, who's going to buy the shares? He says, well, I've got friends in, uh, around the North West, business people who want to put money into the club. He said, well, are these people United fans? He said, well, I don't know. He said, well, there's thousands of United fans out there, tens of thousands of United fans out there. You've told them that Manchester United needed money. They'd throw money over the wall. They wouldn't need shares. That's our relationship. That's the fans' relationship with the game. It's not about having a share in the club to then, then leverage some kind of personal, personal ego at some later date. It's because you care about the club. The backdrop to this event tonight and Supporters Direct and the fans' movement is that a game that's in deep financial crisis. A game that's generating more cash than it's ever generated before, <coughs> but is wallowing in more debt than it's ever had before. Over three and a half billion pounds in the professional game. Three billion pounds worth of debt in the top 20 clubs in the Premier League. 14 of those 20 clubs are not even trading at a profit. That's supposed to be the biggest league in the world. One of the richest leagues in the world. And they can't even trade at a profit. And they tell us we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> There's been over 60 insolvency events since the establishment of the Premier League. So it's not just that they're causing a problem at the top of the game, they're also causing problems right the way through the professional game. Forget, I, I, I don't know the numbers. For, for those number of non-league clubs that have gone through insolvency events. But over 60 out of the 92 professional clubs. Some clubs have gone through insolvency events two or even three times. It's an absolute scandal that if it was happening in any other industry, there would be a public inquiry and there will be government action. There was government inaction. But, and I think this is a very useful rosette for us to wear. Last general election, all three main parties said they needed to do something about the governance of the game. And all three parties said that one of the solutions was getting the fans involved in the game. So we have made headway. We have made huge headway within the governance of the game and we're making headway now also politically. But the alternative to those of you here is obvious. The alternative to the basket case in the casino economy that the Premier League clubs operate in, the alternative is for supporter owned clubs. Clubs that are centred on the fans, clubs that are focused on the communities, clubs, in short, that are clubs. That's what they were when they were first established, where everybody was involved and had an equal say in the way the game was actually governed. And what about us, FC United? Painful establishment in 2005, very difficult decision for us at that time, but we felt that we had no alternative. If we didn't agree with the Glazer business model at Old Trafford, then we couldn't keep putting money into it to then sustain it. So we took a decision, we took a strike, a strike of finance. I still count myself as a Man United fan, I've been a Man United fan till the day I die. But I ain't giving them people my money. I'm not going to allow my money to be used to sustain their business model, which I know ultimately is going to put a greater burden and strain on the football club that I care about. I could just go to the pub and watch it on the telly. I could go walking in the lakes. But I chose, along with a few thousand other people, to actually establish something which will be a reminder to those who run the game that there is an alternative. An alternative that stands in reflection against what they're trying to create. An alternative that puts fans first. Puts the community at the centre of everything we've done. We, we are a community benefit society, we're a co-op. The same as Supporters Direct. Legally, constitutionally, we have to put the community first. We have to put our community benefit before we even put a winning team out on the pitch. 
And the way we've played the last couple of weeks, that's plainly obvious, really. But we're a not-for-profit organisation. We're, we're an organisation that operates on one member, one vote. We argue like cats and dogs about the direction the club's going to go in, what we're going to do, how we're going to do things. He said this, I don't agree with what she said. That goes on in the football club. It goes on in every football club. It goes on in every house and every business and every organisation up and down the country. The real thing I'm proud about is that we can do it in our football club. And that when we do it in our football club, we do it with a purpose because people care. And people can actually make a difference. And that difference that we've made, seen us now have membership in excess of 3,300. We've got average gates of 2,000. We've got season tickets in excess of many season ticket uh, numbers you could see in, in the professional game. We've got over 1,100 people who are season ticket holders. And that's one of the, that again is one of our, uh, our proudest achievements over the last few years, is that three years ago, as uh, the economy was taking its, its dive, we had a discussion at the board meeting about what we were going to do about season ticket prices. Our target always was to give people three free matches a season. So 168 quid it would cost to watch 21 of our games over a season. So you get your season ticket for 140 quid. So we decided to put forward a proposal that you pay what you can afford. The minimum price for season ticket was set at 90 quid, which was our concession price. And then beyond that, you pay what you can afford. The average price paid for our season ticket that first year went up from 140 quid to 160 quid. And it's still above 150 quid three years later. Why? Because like that was we said in the 1960s, you tell the fans you need money, the fans will throw money over the wall. And that is what fan ownership means. It means empowering people to make a difference in their football club. What happens if they don't pay us? More than what we would have charged before? Well, that's their vote on what we're doing. That's also them saying that they can't afford to pay that. We've got one guy who still pays us the same price as what, he, what his season ticket was at Old Trafford. But every time the Glazers put up his season ticket price in case stands, he increases how much money he puts into our club uh, every, every year. But it's not just about the season tickets. With our community work, as I said, is central to our constitution. We've, uh, we've, we've revamped that work over the last few years and we've doubled the turnover on our community, uh, community activities year on year for the last three years. 2009-10, £47,000 worth of community work in, uh, in Greater Manchester. 10-11, £1,001. And this year our accounts are to go before our AGM in a fortnight We've done in excess of £200,000 worth of turnover in the community. This is for a football club that its ordinary activities only turns over seven or eight hundred thousand pounds anyway. And we're doing another two hundred thousand pounds on top of that. That again is the strength of the supporter ownership that's focused on what football can achieve in the communities. Yes, professional football clubs run very good community schemes. But this is a non-league club that's seven years out of the ground it's now got partnerships across Great Manchester that are envy of those professional clubs. We've got a small, very small, full-time team supported by a huge array of volunteers. Up to 300 people, 10% of our membership, volunteer for the club at any one time over a 12-month period. And we're creating jobs. We've got sessional coaches working for us. We've now started to employ more people on the community side of things. And, and uh, next week we're, we're interviewing for a coach coordinator to go and work in secondary schools and primary schools. At the AGM we're about to announce that we're taking our, our, our youth development program into, into new areas as well. And that we've got a, a, our partnership with Manchester College where we're developing new youth team opportunities. All of this without a home. All of this where we've been lodging at Gig Lane. And we've been trying to uh, get our plans for a ground of our own going now for, for five or six years. And it's had its difficulties. We've had one site where we've had grant, granted planning permission, spent a quarter of a million quid getting that planning permission, ripped us from under us after the government um, spending review, didn't allow the city council to, to take that project forward. We've now got another site in North Manchester. That's being challenged at the moment legally. It's a £5 million 
development, of which we've raised in excess of two million quid ourselves. So as all that's been going on on the field, all the community work we've been doing, we've raised in excess of two million quid in seven, year, in seven years to actually bring that, that, uh, that development forward. And we've had support from Sport England, Football Foundation, the City Council, the College, who've also agreed to give money into the scheme. Why? Not because of the United fans, certainly not in the City Council's case, and all City season ticket holders, because most of them are blowings anyway, not even born in Manchester. So, living stock board, Cheadle, they, these, these individuals, these individuals, these politicians, and people from all these through grant funding bodies have put money into our scheme, or promised money into our scheme, because they can see not just what we've done so far, but what we can do as a, as a group, not just as FC United, but as supporters, in terms of creating a dynamic that will make a real difference in our communities, where we can actually use football for a positive benefit for our communities. And it's those, those elements, really, that, that bring us together. Because if you look at any football league anywhere in the world, that league will tell you that the game ain't about winning. Because the majority of teams in any league, whether it be a Parks, Under Nines, or whether it be the Premier League, any league, the majority of teams fail to win the majority of their games. Top nine, ten teams, they'll win more games than they lose or draw. Everybody else fails to win the majority of their games. It's not about winning. So why the hell do we do it? You know, some of you have watched games, and I bet you your, your fondest memories of matches are probably defeats rather than, rather than victories because that's what binds you together. Some of you might be lucky enough to have a bit of glory and win a trophy or two, but that's not the case for the majority of supporters. So why do we do it? It's because it's in our DNA. It's because it's what defines us. Football is what defines us. Our club, the, the club that we follow, defines us. The clubs that we don't follow also define us, because we also like to define ourselves by who we don't support and who other people support. But even look at that from a supporter's point of view. Two of the most recent fan-owned clubs are Chester and Wrexham. Two clubs who've got lifelong, generations-long animosity towards each other, now a few miles apart, flying the flag for support ownership. Wrexham and Chester both looking to raise funds through a community share scheme to actually improve the facilities that their club has. <coughs> I'll tell you what else defines us. We're not those people who run Premier League clubs. We're football fans who care about our football clubs because they're our football clubs. We care about the game because it's our game. We're not there for personal enrichment. We're not there for personal ego. We're there because we care about the game. <coughs> and we're football fans. As we all know, as you'll see on a, on, a, on a quote upstairs from Jock Steen, football without the fans just isn't football. Thanks very much. Cheers.